No, no, please stop, please, please, no, not so much. Uh, you all invited your friends, right? They're all on their way here? Okay, good. All right. Good morning. That's what it's not gonna do, good morning. Okay, you gotta be double as loud, right? You gotta help us sort of fill the volume of the room, so. Because I know there are people just waiting with bated breath to just hop in. So, uh, I'm Gary Bowles, uh, I'm the Chair for the Future of Work for Singularity University, the um, uh, co-founder of eParachute.com, uh, which focuses on bringing tools for career changers and job hunters based on um, what color is your parachute, the um, uh, enduring uh, career manual. And uh, I'm also a uh, partner in Charette. Um, and we're, um, and on top of everything else, a co I'm a co-founder of uh, SoCap. And as my, my wife, Heidi, who is also a co-founder, would say, blah, 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 blah. So that's enough about me. So um, our, our focus this morning is on impact of what I've called the digital work economy. I explore why um, I used that phrase. Uh, I want to uh, first introduce my guests. And then I want to just run through a series of what I call sort of fire starter ideas. And uh, so these are sort of um, ideas, statements, contentions uh, that we can use as a jumping off point. And uh, hopefully we, uh, we not only won't agree on everything, but we'll have a real healthy discussion about um, the seismic changes in the world of work and how that affects the, the world of impact. So uh, I want to tell you why I've invited these amazing people to, to, to join me. So, so Vivian Ming, uh, is probably one of the th smartest people um, on the planet about uh, machine learning, which unfortunately we keep calling artificial intelligence, um, and, um, and the impact in how we think about work. And so um, I'm going to ask Vivian to give us uh, a bunch of her insights about uh, the ways that technology is sort of uh, reshaping uh, the world of work, and because I sort of linked them together, uh, work and learning. Uh, and then Kristen Sharp uh, is executive director um, originally for the Shift Commission, now Shift Labs, uh, through New America Foundation. And uh, Kristen has done an amazing job of shepherding a recent report that I hope you all have read. If you haven't, you should go out and read it um, after this. Uh, it talks about future scenarios related to the world of work and especially has, uh, they've, they've developed a number of insights about the um, impact of the, the seismic changes in work and especially uh, communities and some of the issues related to different populations. So, um, so I want to just jump through these fire starters real quick, and, um, and then we can be off to the races. So uh, one of the learnings when you focus on this arena of the future work is that for, you, know, you have two takeaways. One is we've been talking about these issues for a long time. This is a series of books, articles that have been around for decades. Um, we, you know, the, we've got, gone through transitions in um, uh, the workforce and in the dynamics of work for a long time. And one of the takeaways you should also take is don't write a book with the title, The Future of Work, because it's already been taken multiple I, I times. I love the idea that the future of work is defined by whether you have a cashmere sweater on or a suit. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, right. Yeah, usually, yeah. It usually shows, you know, fairly, you know, well-dressed professional and, and uh, looking deep in thought as to what their future uh, uh, career is going to look like, as opposed to the, you know, mass of people uh, all around the world whose lives are being affected. And so the other thing you find out about the future of work is that it's, it's sort of, you know, the traditional, you know, the parable about the blind man and the elephant uh, sort of problem. It's so huge. It's such a broad landscape. This is just a few of the different topics that people uh, come at it with. Um, I've got some friends who just recently wrote a book on the future of uh, augmented reality and virtual reality, and they do, are doing a series of talks on the future of work, specifically on what, what you do when you walk around with a headset on your head, So, which I don't think we're all going to be doing, but maybe, maybe a few. Uh, so a quick, quick number of fire starters. So we have been through this kind of process before. We called it the shift from an agriculture to an industrial economy. Uh, this time, it's happening in a blindingly short period of time, and the pace and spread of the change is perhaps even more dramatic. And because we don't know where it's going, we, uh, you, the popular press has article after article with headlines about robots and software taking our jobs. Uh, my thesis is work is becoming unbundled. I tend to use that phrase a lot in a lot of the papers that I've written on this, this topic. Um, and it's important to understand that as we change the dynamics of work, what we think of as a job, a one person, one job, is actually an industrial era construct. And, um, and that may be going the, the way of the dodo. Uh, I talk a lot about that, that work is actually sort of three things. When we're paid to do work, it's actually we, we solve problems. We're all problem solvers. How do we solve problems? We perform tasks. How do we perform tasks? We, we use our skills. So it's just those three things. We solve problems, we perform tasks, 
and we use our skills. And so as you think about the changes in the world of work, it really helps to come back to these really three sort of basic constructs. And just so you know, if you're taking notes, I'll post these on SlideShare. I always have them on SlideShare after I talk. So when we talk about robots and software, they don't actually replace jobs usually. What they do is they perform tasks. So remember, it's solve problems, perform tasks, use your skills. They perform tasks, and then a human decides, do all those sort of add up to a job going away? And so it's really important to, to think about that we're, we're really talking about human decisions here. This isn't some you know, sort of inevitable uh, future apocalypse. Um, we also need to think in terms of that there's a lifestyle that people want to have. And in the past we've said that's a job and there's a certain amount of money that they make, but lifestyles are actually the combination of how cheap things are that you want and the amount of revenue that you bring in. So that's one context is that it's just, What's the lifestyle that seven billion people on the planet each want to have, and how can they have that lifestyle? But then the other aspect is work is also, uh, you know, the underpinning of work is that it's the channeling of human energy. And we, many of us have a deep need for meaning. Uh, Insight the sixth is that, uh, and this is something I'm gonna ask both Vivian and uh, Kristen to talk about, is we keep worrying about this uh, job apocalypse, you know, the, in the future about you know, robots and software taking all, sort of, all jobs in the 2050. Uh, but, but really, one of the reasons we founded SOCAP is that we felt that there are things you can do today because the dynamics of the change you want to see actually exist today. And so what are those strategies? Um, and that's something I want to ask uh, for insights as well. And then finally, I tend to use this construct over and over again. I say it's individuals, organizations, communities, and, and countries. What are the strategies that help each of them, people in each of those contexts, to be able to understand these seismic changes that we're going through today and tomorrow? So that's it. Those are the fire starters. So now we can be off to the races. <laughs> so does that give us enough fodder to be I able to bounce around I think it's a great, a great in? launching point. I, interesting, number one, uh, and a lot okay. of this conversation around it's happened before, I, I wish I could remember. I'm terrible at actually citing the people I quote, but this great line, which I'll just paraphrase, about uh, two horses looking at a Model T and one of them saying, yeah, you know, the plow, the wheel, they all created new jobs for horses. This will just be just like that again. Uh, yeah. And, you know, the, obviously, like you said, the question is, is it a kind of fundamentally different shift this yeah. time? Uh, or is this something even more complicated than completely different uh, or just a, a rehash of the same? And what's your thesis? Um, you know, I think that there are great examples. Uh, I don't want to jump ahead of the, the big thing that I mentioned to you earlier, yeah. but we're putting a lot of money behind programming initiatives. A lot of money behind programming initiatives. And, um, you know, in my world, uh, I know a number of people that are building some amazing tools that will allow designers to directly produce their own programs. Uh, so literally just talk to the computer, you know, I need an app that does this, and it leverages this data, and it's in blue with this design ethic, and in five minutes you get a prototype out the other end. Right. Um, and if you're a designer, that is a massive job expansion. You take this incredible hurdle to getting your job done, which is a bunch of people that don't understand design, and they don't understand people, but they got to write the code for you, and you've taken them out of the process. Right. Uh, and, but it's not just out of the process, it's a part of this idea of jobs being transformed is, you know, f five minutes later you've got a new prototype, instead of weeks or months later you have a new prototype. Uh, so certainly as a scientist, I know the difference between how quickly you can prototype out, let's say, a new machine learning program. It becomes a big transformation in what's possible. Uh, so I think that's a great example of, a ver of a, that kind of a shift in the economy, where there's an explosion of new creative jobs replacing old ones, but the old ones aren't farm workers. They are the very computer science jobs that we've just dumped $1.3 billion into training people how to do. We should when, talk about that, that and and we'll, we can yeah. come back to yeah. the specifics of that number, but it, you know, it's, I feel like there's a wild misalignment um, between how we are talking and planning for the future in concrete terms and the understanding that we need more creative work, um, and there's a real distance there. Okay. I, I don't know that it's necessarily just creative work that's the, the 
point of contention, but your example of direct designers is an interesting one because when we did an overarching look at how the future of work is being changed by automation, AI, and emerging technologies over the last year or so, what we found was that most emerging jobs are self-motivated in some way. And so direct designer is one example of that, but there are many others. It, it can be in a creative field or a care field or craft beer, or whatever the thing is, but it's an individually motivated requirement that, that you as the individual identify an emerging opportunity, figure out how to get the skills and training for it, prove to someone or some contingent of people that that's a worthwhile use of your time and skill set and then you know figure out how to do that and that's not what our education system is structured for and it's not ironically what people say they want in a job when you pull people and focus group people and talk to workers across the board at all income levels all demographics all geographic locations across the country the number one thing people say that they want in a job is stability stability of income knowing that they have a job six months from now and knowing approximately what it will pay a year from now it isn't the sort of creativity and ingenuity and autonomy that comes with having a very flexible workforce and so one of the questions that that drives for us is what are the ways in a new economy where everything is self-motivated what are the ways that you can create clear paths to doing some kind of work at all right so, so I, I tend to talk about sort of the old rules of work mm -hmm. and and so we have an education system that was designed for that era so, um, and my father wrote a book called Three Boxes of Life where he talked about this big chunk of education, then big chunk of work, then a big chunk of leisure. So we have an education system, as you said, that's sort of designed for these old rules. And then we thought, oh, we're all going to be working in a relatively static work environment for a long period of time. So it didn't require a lot of, you know, you, you, uh, what I call agency, but, you know, right. um, uh, uh, self-motivation. Um, and so now we've got this new work economy and the challenge is that you're talking about a set of attributes that uh, we, we not only didn't teach people about in our, our schools, but they're, pretty much everybody's gonna need to do that right. because they're gonna be a vanishingly small number of jobs that will that not require that level of agency. So, right. so one of the groups that you looked at was truck drivers, right? right. So everybody's reading all about self-driving trucks. You know, literally truck drivers are in the headlights of autonomous vehicles. Uh, there's three and a half million truck drivers in the United States, um, half of them long haul, half of them short haul. And that was one of your focuses. So what, how did that population think about this yeah. transition? I mean, it was, it was an interesting discussion. We had a number of focus groups, um, mostly in the Midwest, that were um, both long haul uh, truck drivers and delivery drivers, people who delivered for Peapod or, or FedEx or something. Um, and most of them, when asked whether there would be major technological changes that would affect the industry, said potentially in 40 to 60 years. And so the time horizon was a totally different one than people in the technology world think about. Um, so that was sort of the, the number one thing that we thought of. And the number two thing was when when you flagged for people that new training or needing to get into a, a, an agency-driven aspect of the work or get yourself into a new thing, like it's not that they were unresponsive to that, it just didn't occur to anybody naturally to do it. Right. And, and so like, that was a it's, a, it's a major juxtaposition between what the economy is driving people towards and what people are used to doing. So, so, so Kristen, I think, brought up a good point, is that there's um, a new technology comes out, and typically people that are going to be affected by the technology think it's this very long horizon. Right. Technologists think exactly the opposite. Everybody's going to be using it tomorrow. Right. And so when you look at the kinds of technologies that are replacing tasks or you know, have the combination of robotics and AI, and you, how do you think about the time horizons, and how, do you th how should we be thinking differently as to what that means in terms of planning for its impact on different populations or helping different populations to be able to navigate that transition. You know, interesting that the, the difference of opinion uh, is important because one of the biggest barriers to the entry of these sorts of technologies isn't the technology itself or the inventing of it. It's really its integration into a broader system. So if we had uh, uh, Tesla, I think, just announced that they'll have uh, an electric truck and, you know, the plans of making it self-driving. A number of groups are working on that. Uh, in theory, if we built a strong infrastructure to support that, it could be out on the roads within a couple of years. 
And now, if we don't, and if that differs across different state lines, so you hit a line and you have to have someone come in and jump inside the cab and drive the truck onto the other side of the state. If we're talking transnationally, you know, this is one of the biggest job verticals around the world. So if you're moving goods throughout Africa, uh, you can Im imagine again building these very robust long haul transportation systems. Uh, but it's not simply inventing an AI that could actually execute the job that tells you when it's mature and ready for market. Uh, so some of these are really hard uh, to identify, but because they're complex, it also means that some of them come in very quickly and much faster than you would have thought. So the disruption of the travel industry and we may call the short haul, the taxi industry and so forth, happened very, very quickly, much faster than people would have predicted, um, largely because they found ways to go around the infrastructure and just uh, you know, directly integrate into the system. So, uh, you know, it takes me roughly two years, let's say, to go from a concept to the execution on some sort of robust new machine learning system. Right. Um, but to get people to use it is a totally different creature. Right. Uh, and and that, that actually, in some ways, is the heart of the story on both sides. Uh, if you're the technologist, the industrialist, understanding that dynamic, uh, the infrastructure, the changes that are needed. Uh, you know, if we can build systems that can replace, um, you know, I, th I think the most susceptible, the biggest impact job displacements will happen in professional services. So things like medicine and, and law and uh, financial advising, largely because although there's an, an enormous amount of complex judgment necessary for those jobs, the vast majority of what you do is complex but rote. Right. And it turns out that is perfect for the sort of things. If you've got robust data, uh, diagnostic imaging data, uh, lots of examples of risk assessment for financial advising, uh, you know, the typical lawyer, as someone walks in the door, as soon as they walk in the door, you know, this is going to be a will and it's going to be this kind of will. Uh, so most of that then is sort of just a human bottleneck uh, where it's complex making the judgment but it's not actually, in the end, a whole complex series of outcomes. So building an AI that can do that is really easy to do. Building an AI that can do that and then actually has a place in the process of this. It's been extremely difficult to get artificial intelligence into the medical industry, despite the obvious value of it. Um, uh, there's also resistance in the legal industry, again, for good reasons, but inevitably it will happen. But the questions are a lot more about social dynamics than technology. Right. And I think at some jobs too, and potentially in the professional world, will augment people's capabilities. And it won't be an either or. It'll be a, a sense of humans, they, you have to have a human that has a, uh, enough knowledge of the landscape to be able to assess whether the AI is being helpful. Um, right. And, but so as a result of that, you know, there's some room for morphing and changing. The, the, industry that I really worry about is the retail industry and the, the industry where the people are cashiers and things in the service industry that r employ huge numbers of people in our economy, but, but you know, six million people in our economy, but are uh, sort of on the cusp of being able to be phased out. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I agree in, in, in absolute numbers. It's certainly easy to imagine that, uh, uh, you know, Amazon Foods becomes a largely automated system and a lot of what are supposedly some of the best jobs in the country disappear uh, for people that don't have some amazing technical skill that they can sell. Uh, but the one thing I will say uh, about the previous example is that um, I truly believe that there is this amazing place for, for me, when we talk AI, it's augmented intelligence and everything I build is in that space. Can we, just to really shorthand it, can we build super doctors and super lawyers and <laughs> recruiters and, and augment all of these people? And I, I not, of course I believe it's possible because it's what I do, but um, I also believe that it is a, an economic reality. It's something we could move towards. But I do have to say, the, in my opinion, the overwhelming economic trend is the other direction. Uh, yes, we can build these amazing diagnostic systems that take your, your, your GP, and it means they can do amazing stuff right there and then, and we have this sort of data scientist doctor that has amazing capabilities. I love that vision. I think it's a real possibility, 
but right now, you know, you go talk to a CFO of a major health organization, and their opinion is, I can hire three lab techs to do that same job, leveraging the same technology, and we'll get greater throughput. Right. Uh, and I think that is also a real possibility, and it's one that has a lot of economic momentum behind it. So one of the underpinnings of um, the, this whole transition is that you, you've, you've essentially got, I always think in terms of Venn diagrams with these things. So it, to oh, dramatically oversimplify, which my economist friends hate, if, if you got, you know, one circle is all the demand in a particular economy for um, uh, problems to be solved, and another is the supply, like all the people that can solve those problems. We've gone through this oscillation over and over again, you know, throughout um, modern history. What, what the, the decisions about the people that are left behind or the skill sets that are no longer being used as much in the marketplace and then the new skills in the past, it's, the pace of change was not that rapid, and, um, and we also didn't have technology that could augment people to do that additional work. And so the, the, the challenge for in, in more modern economies is that we've sort of kind of already sort of calibrated around existing sets of jobs, and there's a certain pace that we've gone through in the past, but now the pace is accelerating. And so is technology one of the things that can help people with that process, or do we have to go back to the education system and say, okay, we all have to be lifelong learners. This is the only way we're going to get there, is if we're augmenting ourselves. We're continually upgrading ourselves and continually upskilling ourselves. I have a I strong think, opinion. I, I think it's both things. I mean, I think you need to equip people to be able to take risks in their own life in a way that we don't equip people for now, either intellectually through school and being able to get new skills or, you know, providing the... the policy structural support that enables people to do that. You, you have to be able to say, like, I'm going to deviate from what I know in the current job that I have in order to get a new skill and jump into something new. Okay. And we are, we are not set up for that. So um, one of my favorite education findings comes not from an education researcher, but a, a rather uh, famous economist, um, Raj Chetty, it's, who's now at Stanford. And he had this great finding, uh, which was, uh, he was looking at the long-term impact certain teachers had on students. Uh, as an economist, he's looking at the economic impact. Um, and one of the interesting things he found is some teachers really had a big outsized impact. But more interestingly, those students, the students of those teachers that went on to earn more money and go further in their education, in the immediate subsequent years, actually performed worse. It's slightly lower standardized test scores, slightly lower grades, um, which tells you two things simultaneously. One, the things we're assessing kids for are not actually the things that are associated and probably causally related to long-term positive life outcomes. And two, we have an incentive system in place that actively discourages the teaching of these types of skills, for lack yeah. of a better term. Um, now, I'm not one to dump on the education system. I think it gave us this amazing world that we have. Uh, it's really easy for a lot of, you know, uh, tech CEO types to come in and say, education is broken, I'm here to fix it. And you're like, have you studied anything about education ever? Yeah. And I went to school. Um, you know, my wife runs research for the San Francisco school system. We look hard about both, you know, what, how we idealize uh, the, cap the possibilities of people and technology but also about what you can really do. I built an AI, uh, she and I co published these papers showing that uh, it could, uh, by listening to students talk to each other, uh, it could predict their answers on standardized tests. And our vision was, why ever waste the time on those standardized tests? We know they're biased. Right. We know that they're not predictive of, of really interesting long-term outcomes. They take time, they cause stress. What if the learning itself, and this is part of the idea of using AI to augment the, the experience. This is augmenting education itself. Um, and then we, we brought that to a number of schools, from universities to others, and they were like, this is amazing, and this is scary, and what the hell am I supposed to do with it? Uh, and what they really wanted was a technology that could cut their grading time in half. Right. And I'm not saying this to dump on teachers. Uh, I'm saying it because it, it's a this forces it into a policy space where if we're so obsessed with these short-term assessments that don't have a lot of impact uh, in the long run, um, and that's how we're incentivizing our teachers, whether it's a formal incentive or not, then of course all, what they're going to teach is 
you know, do you know how to factorize a polynomial? Do you know when the Treaty of Versailles was? Uh, whatever's on the test, that becomes the whole of my job. When what we need to focus on is, is stuff that has nothing to do with any of that. It is right. about creating those self, uh, those th creating agency. Yeah, yeah. Co co teaching kids um, uh, self motivation, collaboration, you know, following a passion, you know, which the system is not designed to uncover. It is profoundly yeah. uh, misaligned with that. Yeah. But I also think we need to think carefully about whether the current structure that we have, where we're oriented towards everyone having a job and having it be like a pretty structured approach to a job is one that we want to have going forward. If we have technologies that are enabling new approaches, like it, 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 should we start thinking about people in the care economy and you sort of family and community and identity and other things that, that have to do with a full life and not just like your actual income. We, we had a number of potential futures that we looked at in um, the report that the Shift Commission put out and they weren't predictive, they were just possible things that might happen 20 years from now. And one was a world in which, um, in which there were fewer jobs as a result of automation and technology, but that because there were fewer jobs, the things became, production became more efficient, things became cheaper, and people sort of transitioned to a world in which one person had a job and the other family member worked on other things. And, right. Or they did that at different times in their careers and it wasn't so structured towards everybody had to have a job all the time the way we think about it right now. Right. Now that's why I was talking about this lifestyle thing, is yeah. if you've got a target lifestyle in any economy, whether it's um, developed or a developing economy, there's a sort of bar you're thinking about that you want to hit. And either your costs come down <laughs> that lower the bar or your revenue goes up to reach the bar. And so you, it's entirely possible. I mean, we don't, we, we don't factor in. That's one of the reasons that productivity numbers are just a fairy tale nowadays because we don't factor in things like that we're all carrying around these supercomputers uh, <laughs> that have, have more power than, than uh, uh, a mini computer did um, even, even 30 years ago. And so uh, the, the problem is, as we're thinking about the, the policy and the processes that we're trying to support is, well, actually, we really do want people to have a target lifestyle. They want to be able to, whatever it is that they're going for. And is that possible for 7 billion people on the planet? Well, I, I, I strongly agree. I, you know, the nature of a panel on jobs is to talk about <laughs> jobs. Uh, in my work, we look at long-term outcomes in terms, um, here, I'll cite a recent paper, uh, income, wealth, uh, seven different biomarkers of health outcomes, social connectedness, which has become such an overwhelmingly positive associated uh, input that we just take it as an, a desirable outcome nowadays, subjective and objective measures of happiness. Right. So, yeah, we really want to look at these really rich and robust outcomes. But the funny thing is, I think shifting from a defined job to other types of things actually even argues more strongly in favor of agency, if no one's telling right. you what to do, if, if what you've got is time on your hands and access to resources, there is a huge swath of the population that has led a life that has not prepared them for that whatsoever. Yeah. Uh, and it's, it's deeply problematic. Yeah. Uh, you know, we kind of, I'll maybe jump ahead of something that's gonna come up later, but when we talk about things like a universal basic income, it's based on this presumption that freed from the burdens of rent and food, people would just go out and be creative all the time. Yeah, yeah. And the rise of the creative class. Yeah. They'd be that already. We don't pay artists shit. We, <laughs> you know, if you want to be a scientist, go be a scientist. Um, right, this is, we're presuming humans are a different creature than they actually are. And, and that's why I think when we talk about the scary side of these issues, it isn't. What's scary about it to me is not artificial intelligence. It's the phenomenal lack of understanding of people right. uh, that, that really drive a lot of the heart of these problems. So and another, and another underpinning is that, um, and this is something that SOCAP focuses on, um, has focused on from the beginning, is um, at the end of the day, we're talking about a significant amount of employment happens within organizations. And organizational decision makers are the ones that decide who they employ and when they employ them. And uh, we can say that a lot of those are rational decisions, but the truth is that for certainly public corporations and certainly in the United States, the purpose of an organization is to generate value for its shareholders. Well, 
you're, many of you are here because you believe that there's actually a wider range of stakeholders. There are customers, partners, uh, communities in which organizations work uh, in the planet that are also stakeholders in the activities of organizations and should be, and that those all need to be factored in. And so the inevitable results that we're talking about, about you know, continuing to automate things, uh, are not inevitable if humans are involved and if humans make different decisions. That is, there's a different calculus if they have customers and shareholders who actually want them to continue to employ people. So um, I want to make sure this is also a dialogue. So in just a minute, I'm going to open up to, to questions uh, from, from you folks as well. Uh, but one other question. So, so I know a number of the people that are attending SOCAP care a lot, uh, not just about the U.S. economy, but about developing economies as well. So C.K. Prahalad, um, uh, an old friend who was author of um, Fortune at the Bottom of the Pyramid, was famous for saying that uh, developing economies have uh, a number of disadvantages. They, they don't get to pollute as much as we did when we were developing. They have, but they also have a lot of opportunities in that they can leapfrog. They don't have to go about, for instance, in many cases, building a wired telephone network because we have mobile phones now. And so are there opportunities that developing economies have to leapfrog some of the structural issues that we've got and be able to themselves be better prepared for this rapidly changing dynamic in the world of work. My focus is domestic, and so that's, that's sort of the primary lens through which we look at things. But in talking to people who do similar things in other countries, in some ways, that's all, it's already happening in other countries, that, right. that particularly in the developing world, that people already are forced to be entrepreneurial in sort of a lower level economy than, than is the case here. And so you, you see that. Um, I think there's some opportunity for um, looking at, at some of those programs and seeing if there are lessons for the United States from that. Okay. Um, so I have the opportunity to, to work in various things. I've done a lot of work in South Africa, um, uh, some in Kenya and in India and other spots um, around the world. Uh, what's interesting is that, like everywhere you go, um, everyone brags about how entrepreneurial their, their local people are. Um, you know, look, look at them out there on the street, the selling fruit and washing cars and you know, that I have to say there's, there's a certain part of me that says, well, you know, what else are they going to do? Uh, you've sort of, they're forced to go find these things because the unemployment rates for young men are often upwards of 40 to 50 percent. And so this is it. Uh, it gets a little bit worse when big, you know, multinationals come in and then bring their own talent with them to, to do construction or to do oil work. So then you feel even more disenfranchised and you're forced even more to go into these spaces. The funny thing is, one of the strong parallels with these very self-motivated, um, at least self-described as entrepreneurial cultures, is that they tend to be parale paralleled with extremely traditional school systems that are obsessed with standardized assessment. So when you see in India uh, and in a lot of East Africa, uh, certainly in, in China, which is a slightly different story, these like paralyzing obsession with getting your kids the highest score possible in these standardized tests because they just decide everything. Um, so it's interesting that there's this uh, real contrast between what the local institutions are doing, at least the, the more government institutions, uh, and then this sort of inevitable uh, culture that grows up in these communities uh, where people are doing something, um, and I use the term creative very loosely here, but doing something creative with their lives because they need to do something with them. Right. Uh, and so I actually do think that there's something slightly different to be leveraged here because you have these two things often running in parallel. Uh, and if you could break some of the stranglehold that these very static institutions have uh, and get them to keep pace with this change, uh, really, you know, if there is something to be treasured and all of these people having to create their own, uh, their own work, their own experience, then, uh, you know, can we, can we actually leverage that? Yeah. Instead of just having it be, uh, you know, let's turn a brutal reality into a positive self-description. Um, if we could move away from, I don't even know what these schools are training people to do. Um, you know, I'm worried that 
we're over obsessed with a fixed skill set like programming when that isn't going to be a well employed job in the not too distant future. Uh, there, you know, they don't even have that job. So what these formal systems are training people to do is largely uh, sit down and take it. Uh, right. And we need something that, that's rather dramatically different than that. So there's an example in Ethiopia. It's just profiled in the New York Times uh, last week. There's a startup that is, um, the model is they, they um, uh, essentially are, are a private uh, college, but, but with nano degrees. They have a, a very, um, they're, they're based in Ethiopia. They have a, um, although they have an American co-founder. Uh, they, they take, um, they have a very disciplined process of testing. Uh, so they're only kind of skimming the cream, but they then, once somebody has successfully applied for their program, they put them through a training program to become web programmers and web developers and designers and project managers. The, those people sign up, they basically are guaranteed work for the next two years, and then all that work is packaged up and sold as services from remote teams to uh, mostly US tech companies. Very successful model, very well-funded startup, uh, starting to move um, to, to really substantial scale. Um, and so that's one example of routing around the existing education system and saying, let's just leapfrog it <laughs> and let's come up with a business model. And I think it includes an important additional element, which I think is actually just as valuable in the first world, which is um, stop separating out development, so sort of development of self from work. Yeah. You know, so, you know, here we'll send you to a six week career training, and maybe we'll pay for it, or maybe you'll have to pay for it, but you go do it, you won't get paid during that time, you got to cover the cost somehow, and then somehow in six weeks you've learned a whole new career and you go get a new job, as opposed to kind of what you're describing, which is the actual experience of doing the work is development itself, uh, and this sort of thing can be much more strategic than just, right. you know, here's a job, go learn on it, uh, we can really leverage a lot. Um, we uh, are working on projects like this at, at uh, one of uh, my companies, ShiftGig, which is an on-demand workforce company, and I will freely acknowledge, despite my affiliation with them, I'm very skeptical of the on-demand uh, economy yeah. as a way of advancing anybody's life if you're on the worker side of that equation. Yeah. Um, but if you transform that into thinking, we're gonna pay you, we're gonna create value for our customers, we're going to increase our margins by adding value into you over time, and in two years, you are set up to move on to something. You, you, our goal is to make you overqualified right. for our company. Right. Uh, and that is a, becomes an integral part of the business plan. There, there's not a lot of uh, landscape analysis evidence right now about what works and what doesn't in those kinds of things. Right. Um, anecdotal evidence, I, I agree with you on, that when you make the when you integrate the learning into part of the job, and particularly when you integrate it into the learning with part of the job with a defined outcome at the end, people are much, much more likely to go into it and stay motivated to participate as they're going through it. Um, but it's this concept of your, your holistic approach is your, both the company or the individual is getting something while you're doing it, and the sort of train and pray model like doesn't keep people doesn't keep people with it because they're taking all of the risk on themselves without any potential payoff at the end yeah right yeah, yeah. and it's it's a I mean it's a really broad and huge problem and yeah. we keep doing it one of my favorite sets of interviews I think I mentioned this the last time uh, I was on the stage with you was uh, NPR's interviews with former coal miners in West Virginia following the election and it was coal miner after coal miner saying, listen, uh, I don't actually believe Trump, but at least he said he'd get my coal mining job back. Um, I've spent the last 10 years with people promising job retraining and it doesn't happen and it doesn't work. I just want my job back. Um, so I, I'm not saying that that explains the election, but it kind of gets at the heart of this where a lot of our hand waving is around um, you know why young women don't enter uh, the tech industry or the STEM fields is because we need a boot camp for them. You know why coal miners are stuck in their coal mining jobs because they need a boot camp to teach them how to program. We can run a boot camp anywhere and, and do all these sorts of things. And in this case, there is a fair amount of good evidence that those sorts of camps are not very effective. There have been a couple of isolated positive cases, but for the most part, they're not very effective. And um, 
and really give me the idealized person we've been talking about and six weeks, and I bet we can give them a whole new set of skills that are transformative. But they, they are effective when they're paired with an outcome that's clear to the worker in advance. They know that there's, yeah. right, yeah, yeah. So the, we, we do have great evidence that, uh, especially with older workers, that, that um, it, we're, we're advising a group out of the um, government of Singapore, and they um, have, have a, a universal education fund that apparently older workers simply don't take advantage of. And the, and the major reason is because unless they see a fairly guaranteed result right. at the end of learning. Well, I went to school, you know, that's why I talked about the three boxes thing. I did the education box, now I'm in the work box. I don't want to go back to the education box. And so, so if you've got a, so, so really part of the dynamic that we're talking about is the difference between a fixed mindset and a growth mindset. The old rules of work were focused on a fairly fixed mindset. You, 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 over, you, you uh, uh, made a big investment in education early on or in, in training in a field, and then you amortized that investment over a long period of time. You got a law degree, you got a medical degree. That amortization window is shrinking. And so for workers, though, who got educated in that old system and are following the old rules of work, what's the incentive to go back to school? They don't know they've actually got a job on the other end. It's only when programs, for instance, with coal miners, where it turns out that the skill set, there's a certain skill set, um, that actually is fairly transferable to climbing um, uh, propeller towers, uh, that, that actually they know there's a job on the other end, they're far more likely to engage in those programs. And if there isn't, they're not that motivated. Yeah, so, that's right. And then, okay, so I want to open up to your question. So who's, who's got, I'm just going to shout it out. Who's got, please. Just oh, introduce yourself, please. Yeah, Do we have a mic coming? Mike, Mike's and rolling. I'll give it to you. Yeah, okay. Please introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Pavajo, and I've worked um, in the digital space for the last 15 years. Okay. And I'm interested in your perspective on, um, from a society perspective, um, with the AI and robotization, people with, um, so it's um, taking away some of the tasks uh, in, in the jobs uh, and really focusing on, on the soft skills, and that's what's really going to enable people to be successful. But we're not all born with the same capacities. And, um, and it feels intuitively that this new uh, prism is going to increase the divide with people who were born and can't make it, you know, can't change what they were born with and could find a job with like just simple tasks that they could do. And what as a society are we going to do about it? And I know there's that the universal income is one idea, but I'm... I, I'm not sold on it, and so I was wondering what your perspective is on this. That, that's an interesting question because there's some research on sort of inborn personality traits of, of people who appreciate a more hierarchical set out approach in advance versus people who are inherent instinctive risk takers. And that's true, like we're, we're sort of in a education structure, societal structure right now that favors people who are hierarchical and have a set path in front of them and we're moving towards something that's a little, that maybe favors people who are instinctive risk takers a little bit more. Um, I, I think that we'll need to think through both of those things as we go forward and that there will need to be some uh, mechanism for identifying what the pathways to more secure jobs are for the people who want those things and whether that's a, you know, sort of baseline set of jobs or, you know, sort of a new WPA program or something, that's, that's an option, or that we'll all um, move into a world where some people have a fixed kind of job and other people um, jump around more. Um, I, I don't know how you solve that, but I think that we'll end up with a world where both things are in effect, because you're right, there will always be people that need um, that need a clearer pathway, which is why we're, we're all trying to think through right now what are, how do you identify emerging pathways and identify clear paths into them for people who want a more secure approach. So I am actually going to throw out something completely different. Um, in my work, we look at, not a Python reference, we look at, <laughs> um, I, I do everything from greens through large-scale economic development. Um, and two areas I see huge parallels in my work, which is in education, both in the home and formal education, and in work. 
Uh, and in both cases, uh, we look at, and, and I won't have the time to, to, to go through all of the, the background behind this, but we look at the traits that are predictive of long-term life outcomes. So I already listed those outcomes I'm interested in. So what things are predictive of that, that um, are about you, so, uh, and are intervenable, or changeable. Uh, and it turns out we track about 45 different traits. Probably everything you're thinking of in the soft skill space uh, is intervenable at some point in your life. Core cognitive stuff, largely only when you're a fairly young child, but even then, the way someone gets raised, the stress in the household, the, the exposure to language, these have causal uh, impacts on these long-term outcomes. But the rest of them, uh, and I'm not going to go through the individual constructs, but uh, metacognition, creativity, essentially social skills, and emotional intelligence, to just give them really broad labels, every one of those is developable throughout people's lifetimes. Now, what's interesting in agreement with what you said is nobody is good at everything. Nobody. Um, what's interesting in our work, and it actually parallels some strange work done at Red Bull that studies this stuff also, is yes, no one's good at everything, but uh, people that have strengths um, have substantially better life outcomes, uh, and they pair them with complementary uh, skills. Right. So in other words, you have really strong cognitive abilities and metacognition and creativity. You're a great like, inventor by yourself. You don't have maybe great social skills, and you don't always make the right choices in life. The people that are successful with that skill set end up with compensatory skills, which include finding other people that are strong at those abilities to complement them, or maybe they learn not to make rash decisions, so this, they, they transfer their emotional intelligence into metacognition. Um, all of which is to say, and I say this with absolute conviction in my work, everyone is changeable. Yeah. Uh, so I'm not saying everyone is equally changeable, or everyone, is, we're all just a blank slate, but uh, at any given moment in anyone's life, there's something about you that's ready to improve. Uh, it's just a fundamental tenant to my work. So, so I just, um, I'll, I'll hop in too. So a couple of quick things. First off, um, just playing off what, what both of you said, if, if, if our commitment in the going through this transition is no human left behind, then that's a growth mindset. What that means is that we're not going to suddenly decide that uh, IQ 100, everybody above it is going to be successful in the future and everybody below it is toast, right, and needs a universal basic income. Instead, if we all have a growth mindset, um, as Vivian was saying, then, then we, we continually think of people as being able to adapt. It's just whether or not they have come from a context in the past where that was not enabled. We know from over 40 years of work with What Color Is Your Parachute that people, there's three things people need to, to, to determine in the ways that they go about making career decisions. They need to know what makes them unique, their unique mix of skills and other attributes. They need to know where the different kinds of opportunities they, they can either find or create, and then they need to know the mechanics of how to do that. We're actually at a tremendous time in our history where we can actually, we know how to help people to go through that process tremendously effectively and with a wide range of populations. And one example I'm gonna give you, I'm speaking at a conference at Cornell on disadvantaged populations and the future of work in just a couple of weeks. And one of the populations that is often talked about is, is uh, people with spectrum dis disorder issues. And well, it turns out that there's a bunch of attributes that are really, really, you know, sort of center the target for programmers. It turns out that, that's, that there's, there's a bunch of traits that actually are biased towards success with programmers that fit a number of spectrum disorder aspects. And that's just one example. And so if we're thinking about, well, that's an interesting match in terms of traits and capabilities and, and potential challenges as well, but in, and in terms of work opportunities, there's a range of other opportunities. We can think of exactly the same type of process and then make the determination, how do we help people to get there? Like, what are the things we can do to help to upskill them, them or give them the kind of nano training that they need or help them to be able to develop that agency? And if, we have, if our commitment is no human left behind, we're gonna figure all that out. So another question, please. Sorry, who's next? Yeah, we got one here, yeah. But it, it, introduce yourself, please. Uh, hi, my name's Emmett McGregor. I, uh, I work with uh, a digital company that does social selling called Regenerous. Um, and Can you hold it up a little closer? I can't quite sure, so I, uh, I'm interested in your uh, philosophical stances around personal value and the necessity of labor versus expression. 
Um, it seems given uh, physical and mechanical automation and the onset of things like um, lab-grown meats and uh, indoor agriculture, uh, that the base necessities of life uh, may be increasingly offset to automated systems. And so how do you view the necessity of labor to uh, personally actualize someone's self-worth? Um, and are we all essentially becoming artists in 100 years? Are there no more uh, necessary jobs? And how do we personally account for that philosophical change in the way that we view what we're doing now? That, one, that was one of the things that I was most surprised at when we got together groups repeatedly in cities across the country of workers, uh, CEOs, tech leaders, people from traditional industries, policy makers, really in every sector of people who are shaping the world that we live in right now. I expected everybody to focus specifically on jobs or technology in talking about things. And what came up over and over again was the importance of identity in a job. And it wasn't necessarily so much the actual job, but the sense of community and identity that one got from both going to a place and being part of a specific profession. Like, I am a trucker, I am a coal miner, whatever the thing was that was the defining characteristic for their life, it was that that was important to them. Not, not like, I don't think people actually cared if they were a trucker or not, they just cared that they were part of a community of truckers and that was central to their identity. So I think that that is potentially shiftable. It's just that when Gary was talking about the three things that people need in order to find their purpose sort of, people don't have a clear answer to what the where is right now. Like, where are the new opportunities? What can people do to, to define themselves anew, either from, either personally or through the com their communities or through their jobs? And I think we're all sort of exploring that right now. So two of the constructs we track, one we were referring to earlier, which is growth mindset. Um, uh, so lots of Carol Dweck works and others in there. By the way, I'll just add in, it's not just you. If your parents have a growth mindset, the child has better outcomes. If teachers and managers have a growth mindset, their employees and students have better outcomes. Yeah, community-based. Um, so you, the belief that people can change is, is, is really fundamental. But um, in this context, purpose is actually another construct we track. Now, all of these may seem very soft, but you know, I'm a hard numbers scientist. The research on purpose, it's another very clear one with strong positive life outcome associations. Um, here is my feeling about purpose, uh, and, and I think you'll understand why it's answered my, at least my philosophical answer to your question. One, human beings have to have a purpose, period. It's, it's not a choice you make. Uh, you have a purpose. Right now, for a lot of people, they have the shitty substitute of their job. Uh, or maybe Manchester United, or who knows what. Um, but, and if they don't get that, they will go buy a purpose from whoever is selling it. And a lot of bad people sell purpose. Uh, and that's a big issue in the world. But here's the thing about purpose. There isn't one thing you're meant to do in your life. There isn't just this one thing to go find, find yourself, find the thing you love. Um, purpose is a constructed thing. I'm sure there are purposes that are going to resonate more with you, that you're going to have strengths. You know, purpose is something that really has a resonant cycle to you, so you're successful and it feeds back and you get better and you become successful again. The, I frequently joke that the mating call of the American middle manager is who you with. Um, uh, another version is what do you do? Um, uh, what if it was instead what's your purpose? Right. And that is what defines you in the world. I'm a pretty fundamentally lazy people person. Uh, if you know my work, that may sound funny, but I don't value arbitrary work at all. Um, I don't value it in my life. I don't value it in my kid's life. When I see their homework has them write the same thing over and over and over again, I say do it once uh, and then I'll sign it to let them know that that was good enough for me. Um, what I wrote stuff just doesn't interest me. Do actual constructive work in the world and grow with it. So uh, in answer to your question, um, but also keeping in mind what is this world? Do we have a world that allows seven to eight billion people to actually live out their idealized life? Well, no. I mean, not in, in the, not now, not medium term. Long term, I'm, maybe I'm not enough an idealist to, to think that it's going to happen, but maybe it's a possibility. Um, but I still think it's possible for anyone anywhere to be able to construct a purpose. Um, but I think it takes 
it, that's actually a thing. It, it, it takes us constructing people that can construct their own purpose, that don't just wait for it to come to them. Right. Uh, whatever that world looks like of 8 billion people that can construct their own purpose, or maybe 3 billion, um, I, my philosophical stance is that's a better world than I want my kids to grow up in it. So just a couple of really quick points, and then I want to go to the next, next question. So first, um, you, Kristen, you're exactly right. Uh, people have, uh, there's a significant portion of, of at least the American workforce that, that gets identity from their work. The problem is that that has a number of challenges in helping them to go to do something in, in the future. So we try to help people uh, in, our, in our, our workshops uh, through, through e-parachute, we try to help them to say, not I am a truck driver or a lawyer, but I am a person who uses these skills to do that kind of work. Because if your identity is rooted in a certain kind of work and that work is no longer available, then you're on opioids and sitting on your porch waiting for the mind to come back. That's what's happening. And so, so instead, we have to help people to unbundle, to un anchor themselves from that identity, because even though they want it, we have to help them to, to reconnect around a new identity that is far more about solving certain kinds of problems as opposed to being in a particular industry or field because it's gonna change. The other thing about just values and purpose, so we tend to focus a lot, we talk about purpose because um, that's really a helpful construct for a lot of people, but some people actually react negatively to the word, so we use meaning. For some people, especially following the old rules of work, Putting food on the table and a roof over the heads of your family is meaning, and that's it. They don't feel that they need it to come from their work. Now, when we've gone through and helped people to go through career planning, and we give them a choice. Here's a job, or here's work, with everything that you want, including very high pay, but it isn't really about your meaning or purpose. Here's another uh, opportunity for work, and it has not as good pay, uh, it's a little harder, but it has everything you want in terms of meaning and purpose, except for personal circumstances, like, no, I have to keep the thing that keeps paying me more. We find people choose this almost every single time. They want to choose the meaning or purpose if they have the flexibility to make that kind of decision. People in developing economies often don't have that luxury, but if you give people that option to infuse purpose and meaning into the work that they do, we find that they choose it almost every single time. There's a question in back here. Introduce okay. yourself, please. At John Shell from Toronto. Hey, Gary. Hey, John. Uh, Gary, at the beginning you talked about how uh, this is a long-term trend that has now led to you know, difficult jobs, part-time jobs, contract jobs, gig work. And then, Kristen, you talked about the need for stability that's almost universal in the work that you've done. Are there any things other than universal basic income and portable benefits that exist to help create stability that isn't available in good full-time work anymore? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and I think that that's what we're... At, really at the beginning of trying to figure out as a society. I mean, universal basic income is one potential um, answer to that, as is a sense of sort of portable benefits that helps provide people with baseline health care, FMLA, or whatever the thing is. But there are private sector products that people are developing right now, too, to help smooth out intermittent and volatile income. There are p apps that, you know, different sort of worker advocacy guilds have developed to try to allow people to to uh, combine different sources of income into something that is a clearer um, and more stable approach to things. There are sort of um, social and community-based services that are important in helping shepherd people through the job training process that are enormously helpful in the outcome and that really, you know, when you sort of wrap in the holistic helping somebody train and helping them with soft skills and helping them understand how to get transportation and childcare, like those things all contribute to that kind of stability. What I'm talking about isn't necessarily stability of just a job that sort of prescribes all the things for you. It's all the different ways that we need to, to transition to in a new economy that help provide the kind of stability that a job used to provide itself that doesn't anymore. And I should be clear, I'm actually, I'm not a libertarian, I'm actually in favor of a lot of universal uh, benefits, I just don't think it's a solution to the problem we're discussing no. right now. Um, having said that, rather than give specific examples, uh, I think it, there are certainly some things it needs to have, uh, these, these solutions need to have in common, and they're largely about not dumping all of these externalities right on the head of the individual. 
and say, it's your job, you know, you need to upscale, uh, you need to take care of all of the, the, the details of your life, uh, you know, maybe we're here for a job or a gig when you're ready, uh, with realizing that that very short-term, you know, share maximizing attitude is actually uh, doing a real long-term harm to a variety of things, including the, the job market that you're looking into. Right. Uh, you know, we, there are these funny dynamics we see over and over again about saying, hey, you know, uh, there are not enough, let's come back to the programmer thing, but in a different vein here, there are not enough programmers, we need more high-skill programmers, there's this constant hunger for high-end talent in the Bay Area. Um, Yet I marry that with the fact that there is a constant hunger for jobs amongst programmers in the Bay Area. So what's going on? Uh, that there are not enough people qualified for the jobs amongst the, the huge number of qualified people that already exist. Uh, and one thing I would contend is it's not whether you know Python or Java that matters, it's these other things we've been talking about. And if you don't have it, uh, then we pick up on that. Another is Stanford and MIT only turn out so many uh, employees, uh, students. Um, and really, let's be blunt, a lot of first line filtering for recruiters is do you have that pedigree? Uh, so, you know, a transformation in how we value people in a really broad sense. Uh, and I don't know, you know, this could feel like a call for a lot of government intervention. Uh, I would love to see something lighter weight. Um, uh, you know, I, I don't think, for example, that um, blockchain is the end-all be-all, but there are some interesting new trends in distributed trust networks and things like this that, hey, is, is it possible for there to be something, uh, you know, on which our social capital can get exchanged in a meaningful way that living your life sort of in the right way actually, uh, in a sense, pays for itself. Uh, it, I, I'm not certain what these are. All I know is that whatever the existing institutions are, they need to start moving more quickly than they are. Right, right. So, so John, we've had this conversation, so and I think we're at the point where we're gonna, we're gonna have to wrap up. Um, but um, just really quickly for the group. So first off, um, I always say universal basic income is the right answer to the wrong question. The question is not that we need to basically figure out how to help people who are all disrupted by robots and software taking their jobs. The real question is, should any human being go without food on their table or a roof over their head? That's the question. That's the one to answer. So think, think worrying about some dystopian future where we have to sort of come up with these constructs. Um, the, 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 reason, the reason we have this conversation so many times, to, to, to sort of jump to this end point, is um, what I call high-tech dancing in the end zone. So, you know, football reference. So, so in, in Silicon Valley, people just sort of basically assume, you know, robots and software take everything, or, or automation takes everything. So we have to jump to uh, this, this future where we can't, and, and we have a failure of imagination, we can't envision what all that work people are going to do is. And so it, at, at scale, it matters. On an individual basis, it matters less because what really needs, what each individual needs to have is agency. So they're going to either find or create meaningful compensated work for themselves in the future. And so the, there are strategies, you know, as, as John and I have discussed, that, that are, are ways to distribute capital more effectively then the way we do it now, especially with startups, which is a venture capitalist and a couple of founders make a ton of money and nobody else benefits. No Uber driver is, has stock in Uber um, unless they bought it themselves. And so there's, there's a variety of strategies to think about in terms of ways we recalibrate value that is distributed in, in more effective ways to build the kind of economic benefit that we have. And, and impact capital is, is one of those. It just has to have a different set of intentions than the way a lot of capital and organizations are, are currently calibrated. So I think we're, we're out of time. Maybe one last question. One last question. Introduce yourself, please. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Kwaku Osei. Uh, I run Cooperative Capital. I'd love to bug you guys later, but uh, my question is three-part, and I'll try to be swift with it. Okay, yeah, try to keep it as tight yes. as you can, because we want to make sure we're The first question time. is, um, you mentioned uh, earlier that there was hard data that you had um, supporting uh, purpose and the benefit of that. Could you tell us where we might be able to find uh, some of the good research that you've, uh, you've come across with that? Um, the second question is, um, what are the things that you guys are currently working on, um, like your biggest effort? And then the third is, like, what is a way that anyone in this room um, that maybe wants to assist you all in any way um, would be able to tap in and plug into what you're doing to help assist your efforts? 
Okay, Thank can, you. Can you make this a lightning round thing and you guys want to just answer real quick? <laughs> so, sure. so I know you got to talk about the data thing, but do you want to talk about efforts and, and next, about Shift Labs and sure. assisting? Uh, very quickly. So next steps on Shift, shift Labs are to go uh, and take the national level conversation about what the future of work looks like to specific communities and cities around the country and say, what, what kind of future would you you like to have in your city and types of jobs that you would like to see here and then connect all the different players in that community. Everything from the business community to the workforce development to the schools, community colleges, uh, everything that that is part of the community of sort of developing new opportunities for people and connecting those pieces together to, to look at that as a holistic thing. Um, then what action steps people can take or I think like if you um, thinking both carefully yourself about how to transition and augment your skills and, and sort of be proactive in your own life. And then um, I thought that, Vivian, you had a great point that the community of people that you're around, it, that's a changeable thing and inspiring creativity and inspiring sort of new thinking in the people that you're around, whether it's your kids or your coworkers or whatever, is a, is a helpful thing right. that everybody can do. Right. Uh, okay, so some specific, citable stuff. The easiest thing for me to say in the moment is go to Socos Learning. So Socos is spelled up there, socoslearning.com. We have a section with a whole bunch of uh, research links, our research, others' research. Um, I referenced a PNAS paper. It has a title of something like Health, Wealth, and Well-Being. Uh, they did research on 8,500 um, people in the UK uh, for that. So you might be able to use that enough to, to find that particular link. Um, but if you look in our stuff, you'll find a bunch on purpose. So two really quick things. Pure data side working on a big project now with Accenture. I get to be a mad scientist and just use the data on 425,000 people to do whatever the hell I want to do with it. What we're working on is something called employee lifetime value. Can we actually measure informally, without, without annual 360s or surveys or assessments, how someone is contributing to the organization, including all of those informal, soft, emotional labor Im impacts, um, and then present it back out. And some of the initial stuff is really exciting to someone like me because you see things like women are overwhelmingly systematically undervalued, but actually more accurately, collaborative leaders are overwhelmingly systematically undervalued compared to hierarchical leaders. So that's, that's a very tangible, for example, lots of math, lots of complicated stuff. It's, I love doing that sort of thing. Um, uh, the other, oh, I was gonna mention one other thing uh, to finish with. Uh, well, we do a lot of education work, uh, and, and it's pretty fundamental to who we are and, and where we focus. And one of the aspects that's a, another mirror between education and work comes from behavioral economics. It has the boring title of belief-based utility, but it boils down to this, the belief that your hard work will pay off. Right. Why do people want sure things? Why do they make these choices towards sort of a more static, guaranteed, because of a very uh, genuine, lifelong learn lesson that, yes, I am in theory qualified to do that thing, but I don't actually believe it's gonna pay off in my life. We see this uh, in underrepresented students getting full scholarships to top universities and then not taking them. You see it in women dropping out of executive ranks. I think this is the defining characteristic there. You see it again and again and again. People's um, sensitivity to risk, it does vary in the population, but it's actually uncorrelated with these, these decisions. It's not that you're sensitive to risk, you actually just don't think there, there's not risk here. It will not pay off. Yeah. If we could change that at scale across broad swaths of the population, um, you would see massive changes, uh, in, particularly in targeted populations. But when I talk about targeted populations, I'm talking about the vast majority of the world's population. Right. So th this is my big wish list thing. So just really briefly, so um, uh, I don't want to thank my guests. So uh, we have an initiative called Fulcrum. Uh, you can email me, um, uh, I'm trying to see, I don't know if we can bring up the last slide, but um, you can email me at gbowls at gmail.com or stalk me on LinkedIn and mention SOCAP. 
but we have an initiative called Fulcrum, and so we kind of think of it as our, as our next SOCAP. Um, we're bringing together a network of networks, um, wide range of stakeholders to focus on strategies at the layers that, that I was talking about, individuals, organizations, communities, and countries. And uh, so we're, we're at the, the front end of bringing a, a range of stakeholders together. We're going to do a series of convenings. Um, and we see it, um, you know, a tremendous opportunity to be able to help uh, cross-fertilize between uh, amazing um, initiatives uh, that are out there that are focused on this arena because it's such a huge ocean <laughs> that, that uh, you know, we're all trying to boil. Uh, but we think, we think that it's, it, these are tractable problems. These, we think that we can actually, if, it, I, I liken it to global warming. If we don't do something, we're going to get the dystopian future. So we need to get active. We need to pick, you know, um, uh, as Krista was saying, that what part of the, the elephant we each want to focus on and just coordinate our efforts a little bit better. So anyway, please thank my guests. Thank you all for your attention. We'll be around for a few minutes. Awesome.